Professor Ulva Beckström. Thank you for being here with us today, Ulva. Uh, you will be talking about gender in finance from another perspective, uh, the, the investor and the, the person receiving advice where gender is playing a role, and you've, you've studied that. But, but first, let's just... Couldn't you just, just tell us about your interesting background as well? You're uh, uh, now at King's Business School in London. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Swedish from the beginning. I'm Swedish. Yeah. I think it's going to be turned on now, any moment. <laughs> oh, you know what, Ilva? If you want to. Uh, <laughs> do oh, you that. can do it. That's oh, yeah. oh, nice. Oh, no. Okay. L let's chit chat while, 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 while <laughs> things are happening, while, while technology magic is, is being done. So, you have experience both from banking, mm -hmm. but also from psychotherapy. Yes, so I um, I think I'm going to, this is my first slide, so you're sort of slightly... Okay, I won't uh, yeah. That's okay, but, but yeah. I, so I've been in the... I'll just let you yeah, take yeah, okay. care of it. Then. Well, so I've been in the... Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I, I'm today, I've got a bit of a UK hat on, and I was thinking, it's a shame I didn't bring a mask of the Queen, and that would have been pretty cool, right? So um, I don't know so much about how this goes on in Sweden, but I know a lot about what happens in the UK. And it's quite fascinating to hear you talk about gender inequality in Sweden, because I'm thinking you're so ahead of us. It's incredible, but there's still quite a ways to go. So the first thing I want to do before I start is I want to make a plea to an innovator. And I would like that to be a female innovator because this is not woman friendly. I am, yeah, I'm a woman of dresses. I will never be on stage wearing trousers because that's how I feel good. This is not convenient. It's inside of my tights. Okay, so please can somebody innovate something a little bit better than this for us women and men who want to wear dresses? Just hang it around my neck? You reckon wear it like a necklace? <laughs> what you mean this thing? It's gonna be a bit heavy, isn't it? Okay, maybe I'll try it next time. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start undressing now on stage here. But the question was about my um, about my career. So let's start with that, perhaps. Oh, are we not on the right slides? Should I keep going? I don't have a video of myself, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, good. Now I keep clicking. Right, so I now work at King's Business School. Here, Joanna and I, we are in the 14% club because I'm a researcher in finance. And only 14% of researcher in finance are women. But I come from other clubs before joining academia. I did my, my, my PhD in finance at Cass Business School. Before then, I was the CEO of, a, of an, um, a fintech business. That I call the 0% club, <laughs> probably, because I was not just the only woman founder, the only woman on the board, the only woman in the company full stop. We also didn't have a single female client. So that's a zero percent club. So that's before becoming an academic. Then I was a banker and advisor for many years. I worked for Morgan Stanley, Coote, Standard Chartered Bank, all in London. That's the, probably the 10 percent club because I was a senior in, in banking. Possibly 10 percent, 10 to 20, depending on how we look at it. So that's the 10 percent club. And then I'm also in the 90 percent club because I'm a psychotherapist, and that's a woman's job, isn't it? Yeah, we talk about feelings, we're nurturing and caring, but I want to say this is, this is actually not what my talk is going to be like, but there is a scale to personalities and gender, right? If here is aggressive and here is nurturing, we all have a spectrum. But if all you do with me is hone on my nurturing skills, I will become really, really good at nurturing. And if all you do is encourage boys and men to take risks, they become more at the aggressive type stuff. But give all of us an opportunity to do both. Why not? But that's not what I'm here to talk about. We are going to talk about investments today. So why are you here or why are you listening to me today? Firstly, we're going to get an insight into a little bit about investment research. 
investment advice to wealthy individuals. And when I say wealthy individuals, I'm talking about millionaires, because that's who I used to deal with. When I worked in banking, firstly, I was, I was running structured products areas. This used to be a day when structured products were sexy, believe me or not. We had high interest rates. We weren't scared of credit. There were things were going on in that business, and it was quite exciting. Not so exciting anymore. If you work in structured products, it's probably time to look for another job. <laughs> I then looked after investment portfolios for very wealthy individuals. My largest client had $400 million to invest with me, so that's a considerable amount of money, I would say. Um, and so I then worked with clients and bankers looking at judging how they should invest. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and specifically with regards to gender. We're also going to think about perceptions, okay? When I walked on stage today, you know when I told you my mic was in my tights? Yeah? You all had to think, you had thought about me, some sort of opinion about what I'm like, who, I'm, who I am, what am I going to say today? Is she going to be competent, not competent? But, and I can guarantee that all of you so, thought something slightly different. You didn't think the same thing about me. And then I've got a perception about myself. I feel a bit better now because I've started talking. Nervous in the beginning, right? And that perception is going to be different to what you think about me, right? So there's a clash possibly with the social perception, the way you look at me and the way I look at myself. And that's what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to think a little bit about where we can go from here, or rather, where is my research going from here? But why should we care about wealthy men and women? It's all on this slide. I don't need to repeat it all. Basically, people, the gender inequality, the, sorry, the wealth inequality gap is widening. That's unfair, right? It's horrible, actually. But what, what it also means is that how the wealthy spend their money has large societal ec and economic effects. Yeah? They own hotel chains, they employ a lot of people, they actually have a big, big say in society. And what is good news here for women is that we are getting rich faster than men. We might not be successful in our marriages, as we heard earlier on, but we are getting rich faster. And not just that, our source of wealth is changing. When I worked at Coots & Co, I don't know if anyone knows that bank, but it's a very traditional, it's a Queen's Bank in the UK, then we had a client group called Acquired Wealth. Now, that client group was focusing on divorcees and inherited wealth. I'm not sure that they're allowed to call a client group that anymore, possibly not, but that, those were the days. And actually, in my employment contract, it stated that I had to wear naturally colored tights every day at work. It's not that long ago, I'm not that old, but it's quite shocking. But now, women are obviously in the executive position, female entrepreneurship is growing faster than men, at least in the UK, so women are changing. However, when you look at academic research, and I'm not going to talk about lots of maths here today, I'm just going to show you the, uh, the highlight of it, is that effectively, when it comes to investing, women are less risk tolerant. They invest less, they feel less comfortable taking financial risks. They feel like they know less, they feel like they know less. And they feel less confident about the investment decisions that they make. Now, there's one problem with that research. This is when I started my journey to my PhD, is that all academic research to date, apart from mine, looks at mass affluent investors. When I say mass affluent, I mean people with less than $100,000 to invest. That's still quite a lot of money, fair enough, but when you're a millionaire, you're not worried about securing your financial future in terms of retirement income, but people who have less have to be concerned with that. So it might be that other women are different. Now, why is this? Why do women feel like this, I was wondering. I looked at the UK history, okay? The, I'm not sure what it looks like in Sweden, so apologies, it's got a UK filter on it, but it's probably not that far off. You were probably 10 years ahead of the UK, on average. Does anyone know when the London Stock Exchange was founded? Well, 
I'm sorry, but that's quite far off. Um, but um, 1689. 1689, that's a long time ago, right? In 1973, they allowed women to become members. 1975, in the UK, a woman can open a bank account in her own name without a male signatory. I'm serious. I'm talking about having the legal right to. Some banks would allow women to, but having the legal right to. In those days, you know what entrepreneurs did, female entrepreneurs? They wrote the letters to apply for credit using a male name. And that's how they got their credit. So in, until 1980, women couldn't apply for credit in their own name. This means that a woman who wanted to buy a TV on credit, for example, or a sofa, if her husband didn't have a job but she was, and she was the earner, he still had to sign the form. And the next time you wonder why the guys are buying the rounds in the British pubs, it's because until 1982, women were not allowed, or they had, didn't have the legal right to spend their own mom, money in a pub. So the rounds sh really should be on the men, right? Then, until 1990 in the UK, women were not taxed independently of their husbands. Quite shocking. And then, 2017, 17, the World Economic Forum says it will take at least another 100 years. I mean, that's an exaggeration. It could take a lot longer, isn't it? To, to remove the gender inequality gap in economic terms. But even if it only takes 100 years, that means that I won't see it, my daughter won't see it, and possibly neither will her daughter. And that is quite shocking. However, things are changing, because in 2017, men spent more money on shoes than women. <laughs> Anyone guess what kind of shoes it is they spend money on? Why is that stats like that? Exactly! Trainers, it's all about trainers, or sneakers if you're American. Yeah, absolutely. So things are changing. So when you looked at my previous slide, I'm wondering if some of that has got to do with because before the 1970s, we had a quota. It was a 100% quota for men in the financial services industry, right? What does that mean? It means that finance is a new area for women. And when something is new to you, is anyone in this room horse ride? Who horse rides? Yeah? Scared of horses, the horse riders? You scared of horses? No. Anyone who doesn't horse ride? Are you scared of horses? Indeed. Yes. Why are you scared of horses? Because you don't understand them, right? They're big, they're horrible, they're scary, right? Money is big, it's horrible, it's scary. And if you haven't done it, it's scarier, so it's a new area, and it's scary for women to enter it because it's not, it's not like your mom or grandma sat you down and talked to you about finances. What did they talk to you about? My grandmother taught me to knit. She taught me to bake. She taught me to cook. That's what she did with me. What are those things? They're on the nurturing scale, right? She didn't talk to me about investing. Nobody talked to me about investing when I was little, nobody at all. Therefore, just like women were excluded from finance, men were excluded from parenting, I would say. So therefore, I think men feel less confident about their abilities to parent. So it's got two sides to the coin, really. So we have to bear that in mind. Anyway, back to what we were talking about. So I was thinking, that you know, men and women are changing, men are not, not women, we are different. However, not all women are the same. And I was thinking that what about wealthy, successful women? Are they really less risk tolerant, less confident, less knowledgeable? I am very, very risk tolerant. I, th I thought about myself, I'm thinking I've made it in a man's world. I'm, I'm very, very prone to taking risks, and I'm very happy to do so. So I wanted to check if it was true for wealthy women. And the other thing I wanted to see, what about financial advisors? How do they judge women? Do they recommend enough risk to women? Do they judge them differently to men? I wasn't sure. So before telling you about my research, I need to tell you about how in the UK, and I'm sure it's very similar here in Sweden, correct me if I'm wrong, how 
we determine suitability. When I say suitability, I'm saying when you have an individual client in front of you, the financial advisor has to look at you and they have to judge you and they have to come up with what is suitable for you to invest in. So you might have the optimized portfolio, right? We have a certain risk and return according to your risk profile. Is everyone with me so far? Yeah, some people might have an aggressive risk profile, some have moderate, some have conservative. Did you hear those names? Aggressive, moderate, conservative. Which one appeals to women? Do we want to be aggressive? Not really. That's a, male, that's a male kind of terminology that we use for investments, right? So that's something we can talk more about, but I think that specifically doesn't appeal to women, so we probably end up in the moderate category naturally just because of the words that are being used. So. In the, UK, in the UK, we have the Financial Conduct Authority that everybody fears. The Financial Conduct Authority stipulates that you have to evidence suitability. Some banks have an investment questionnaire. Do they have investment questionnaires in Sweden? Yeah? Okay, so you have a questionnaire, you fill it in with your clients. Usually, if you have a robo advisor, you do it online. But if you sit face to face with your advisor, it's a joint thing you do. Some banks don't have those questionnaires because it's not a requirement, it's just a requirement to evidence suitability. Therefore, the financial advisor has a lot of subjectivity in how they judge their clients. And that's interesting. So I set up a study. In my study, I created vignettes. A vignette is a short description, a pen portrait of a person. It could be like Amanda is 45, she runs a hedge fund, she's got a net worth of seven million pounds, um, she has um, a child in private school, you know, school fields in the UK is quite high, um, and she's divorced. She told you she's got experience of investing in private equity. That's one vignette. I created 10 vignettes. And then what I did is I changed the gender. So Amanda, I just told you about, she was called Paul. So Amanda had an Amanda, and Amanda had a Paul. And then I sent a survey to lots of advisors, and I asked them to recommend a portfolio to each of the 10 clients. I asked them to make a judgment about how, how knowledgeable they thought the client were about investments, and I asked them to make a judgment about how confident they thought the client were, okay? So you're with me, so basically they were judging exactly, so half the advisors saw vignette one as a woman, half as a man. Vignette two, the opposite. So we had 10 vignettes in total, so I did a complete exact comparison of gender. So they judged exactly the same person, which obviously you can't do when you meet somebody in the flesh, because then lots of other things come into it. And then, because I think that the way we judge others affects the way we feel about ourselves, right? And the way we feel judged by others affects the way that we feel and they feel about themselves. It's like dating, right? Been on a date before, we've probably all been on dates. Some people, you go on a date with them, they make you feel beautiful. They make you feel smart, skinny, whatever it is you want to feel. And then you go on another date, and you, you can't speak. You feel ugly, you, feel, you just can't wait to get out of there. You know that feeling? That's what happens when you give advice to people too. There are feelings involved. So I went out to approximately 200 advisors. I'm still doing this work, I'm still collecting data, but I've published some of this work already. And I found this. Okay, now you have to be with me in the quadrants here. So basically, here we have a male advisor making a judgment of a male investor, male advisor making a judgment of a female investor, female advisor making a judgment of a male investor, female advisor making a judgment of a female investor. So we've got four possibilities. I found, as you can see quite clearly on here, is that the male advisor, remember, equivalent people just the gender changed. Male advisor gave the highest ratings and highest put 
portfolio recommendations to male clients on average. In particular, both male and female advisors thought that women were less in control over their investments. I then found that female advisors gave the lowest ratings to female clients. Now, when I do this training, I run training for banks here in, in the UK. Then when I get to this point, the men always feel pretty good. Because what, what does this tell you? Are the women a little bit more biased, maybe? Is that what that could tell you, possibly? Is actually, because I said earlier that women don't invest enough. So we don't have enough money to secure our retirement. And here I'm telling you that actually, it seems that the men, I know that it doesn't say anything in this box, but actually the male advisors give higher recommendations to the female investor than the female advisor does. That's quite interesting, isn't it? I had hoped it was not going to be like that, but now, but obviously you can't do that with research. You can't go in, you know, you can't go in thinking this is what it's going to come out as. And now I know better and I, I understand why that is now and I'll explain that to you after I showed you this. Because then I went to the clients, the investor. So now I'm not looking at the way that the advisors perceive the clients, now I look at how the investor perceive themselves and how that relates to the gender of their advisor. Okay, so we move to the investor now. Here, a male investor with a male advisor, doesn't matter. Male investor with a female advisor, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do to the man. He doesn't feel differently about himself. He doesn't invest any differently, regardless of the gender of his advisor. Can anyone work out why? Yeah. Um, if I go way back to that slide with, the, with the, um, a timeline on it, we might mess up the whole thing here, so I'm not going to do that. But remember when I went back to that? It's been in the male DNA for hundreds and hundreds of years investing and finance. Therefore, it's a stable trait within a man. Yeah, the investment risk tolerance is a stable trait. It doesn't matter what treatment you give him, he will still be all right. Whereas for a woman, because it's a new area, relatively new, maybe some of you, a lot of you in here weren't born then, um, but um, it's a much newer area to a woman than it is to a man. So for a woman, I found it matters greatly what the gender of their advisor is. Here, I find that a woman has a male advisor, she feels the least confident, the least knowledgeable, and she invests the least. Okay, to the extent of 11%. She invests 11% less if her advisor is male. That's massive. That's highly, highly statistically significant. You really can't pronounce that, can we? It's impossible. However, if she has a female advisor, she invests a lot more. She feels more confident and she feels more knowledgeable. And what's really interesting about this is that not only does she feel more so than if she had a male advisor, she's more confident, more knowledgeable, and more risk tolerant than the men in my sample. So what do we think about that? What could that be about? Guess what percentage of financial advisors are women? Five, okay, it's a, it's a good guess. It's, um, it's um, about 10%. But um, in the high net worth space, actually, it's higher. It's about 20%. So most of the banks I work with in that space, they have about 20% female financial advisors. But it's low, right? So what does it say about the woman who goes and finds a female advisor? Is it possible that she has an aggressive recruitment strategy? Yeah? I know a woman who calls the CEO of Barclays to say, I want a female advisor, fix it. So that woman is not shy, is she? 
So it's possible that the women who go out and find the underrepresented female advisors are already more confident, more knowledgeable, and have a higher risk tolerance. But we have a problem. What problem do we have here? You have to help me out. Suitability test, yes, that's a problem. But what else can we see on this, on this slide here? That is a problem. I 100% agree with suitability. I can discuss that for ages because every bank has a different way of, of um, uh, estimating a risk tolerance of a person. Technically speaking, you should have the same risk tolerance wherever you go because it's your risk tolerance. But that's uh, something else that I really want to do research on, but to be discussed maybe later on. But here, do we have a clash? Mm. We have a clash. Because here we have an issue because the female advisors, I mean, obviously this is two different samples, right? Here I'm looking at investors, here I'm looking at advisors, and I'm finding that the advisors are likely to make the lowest judgments about the client if they're female. And here I'm finding that a female client is likely to invest the most and feel the best about herself as an investor if her advisor is female. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Now, these are clients with several millions to invest. A financial advisor who, who has a high net worth base, they might earn between... Um, starting at 50, 60, up to 300, 400, if they're extremely successful, 1,000 pounds a year, but they are nowhere near as rich as their clients. Nowhere near as rich as their clients. So even if, which I'm finding in my research, a bit of mirroring going on, you know, what's good for me must be good for you. That is rubbish in this area because somebody who is much, much less wealthy and has a completely different life circumstance can't make that judgment about their client, can they? It's not appropriate. Not appropriate. So here, it seems that the men are less biased, doesn't it, when we look at this? But it seems it really matters to the woman who her advisor is. So... I wanted to find out about the advisors and how they feel about themselves. Because I thought, well, why is it that this happens? So, um, I would like you to guess with me. Um, compared to male advisors, do women have higher or lower risk tolerance compared to her male colleagues? Up or down? Down, lower, you, th you say everybody thinks lower? Yep, you're right. So on average, in my findings, the female advisors judges their own risk tolerance to be lower than that of her male colleagues. What about confidence? This is a woman who's made it in a man's world, right? Does she feel more or less confident than a man, her, her male colleagues? Less, she does, she feels less confident. What about knowledge? She feels more or less knowledgeable. Less. This is pretty scary, isn't it? Pretty scary. What about her own portfolio? Does she invest more or less than her male colleagues? Less. Does she say that she invests more or less on behalf of her clients? Less. Okay, women. It's time for you to understand, for all of us to understand, that we are good at what we do. We know what we're doing. We have most likely worked harder to get to where we are than our male colleagues have. And you know what that means? We have studied more. We have prepared more. So we should feel comfortable about that knowledge that we have. But it's a problem in the advice industry. Because it seems that possibly these female advisors are pushing on that lower risk tolerance to their female clients. So, challenges for advisors. Now, 
I did say that the male advisors appear to be less biased, right? But it could also be, because we don't know from this research, causality is always hard to evidence, we don't know, it could be that the male advisors indeed are overconfident and they're pushing more products onto their clients. We don't know that. It could be that too. Now, obviously we know that female investors invest more if their advisor is in female. We know that we have a problem in terms of mismatch. But what do we do about it? What do we do about it? From the investor's point of view, it's shocking how much the women prefer a female advisor. In my sample, over 50%, I think it was 54% of the female millionaires had a female advisor. Only 20%, 10 to 20% of the advisors are female. That tells you something about how they are going about recruiting and the demand for the advisor. The men didn't seem to mind if they have a female. There's some research saying that men also prefer a female advisor, but I haven't found that in my research. I think it's about 50-50. Now, the other thing, and we had somebody on the panel talking about this earlier, is that women want to invest in businesses with senior women in leadership positions. So women, so I found this in, in the banks, when I go around and talk to the banks about this, um, they say that one of the strategies that they use to attract female clients is to put on events where even if the, if the banker or advisor is a man, they make sure that they have a large representation of senior women at the event. And if they do that, the woman, the client, the woman client, doesn't mind if her advisor is male, as long as she can see a reflection of something she's impressed with in the organization. But they think that investment advising is male-orientated. And I wish I had some pictures in there. We talked about culture earlier on, and it is quite funny. I said something about words, didn't I? And we, we talked about the history and how before the 1970s we were sort of ex excluded from finance. But the other thing that I'm quite passionate about is thinking about the culture in organizations. And I really liked when you talked about changing the, the, the way you talk about things. I mean, when you go, I worked in so many banks and it, the men stand like this, like practicing in golf swings, you know, and, then they, and, and you're right in the, the metaphors they use. And you think of it, it's so, it's so boring, basically, isn't it? it it's not attractive for, for me anyway. Um, so it's a very good thing to think about the culture and the language in organizations. But now, this is the point I wish I had a, a picture. Because have you ever looked at the buildings where banks are? I mean, Stockholm might be a little bit different here. Skyscrapers, right? What do they look like? <laughs> what do they look like? They look like penises, don't they? Yeah. So not only is the language in the businesses male-orientated, the marketing material, the words we use to describe investments. I don't know, would derivatives be called derivatives if it was, if it was made up by a woman? I don't know. Maybe it would be called alterations, or I don't know, it could be called something different, right? Everything was created by men. It's not men's fault, this is just the way it was. But we need to challenge that, I think. Now. It is important to know that women can have a higher risk tolerance than men, but it matters what you do to that woman in order to unlock that within her. So, I started off by saying that self-perception doesn't equal social perception or the other way around. The way that you view me doesn't tally with the way that I view myself. We've said that there's a problem in the industry, that we have very few female advisors. It's a great profession for a woman. I don't know why women don't want to do it. It's actually quite flexible. You can run your own book, you can work from home wherever you want, really. Quite flexible. So, we need to challenge the stereotype. We need to make sure that we don't put any limitations onto people because of their gender. Being woman, being man, being gender neutral. 
And we have to do the same to ourselves. We need to stand up straight and we need to be confident that we know what we're talking about as women. If I have five more minutes, do I have five more minutes? Of course. Of course. Okay. All right. So what do we do now? What am I doing now? Okay, so I told you about all these rich people, but does that really matter? They are already rich enough, aren't they? It doesn't matter if somebody who has 20 million invests a little bit less or a little bit more, if they're a man or a woman. Really, what about the average woman? And actually, I think this is pretty good as Warren Buffett thing. It's a terrible picture, and I should get better at my PowerPoint slides, really. But risk does come from not knowing what you're doing. So if we know what we're doing, we shouldn't be so scared of the risk. It's a horse, a horse example, isn't it? This is the UK. This is reality. Women, on average, earn £260,000 less in their careers compared to a man. I'm not sure what that's like in Sweden, but it's still here, isn't it? There's still a gap. Full-time employees, that equates to 18%. Part-time is 36%. However, what's really, it, it, it's basically widens in the 40s. Why does it widen in the 40s? Children, yeah. Terrible parental leave policy in the UK still, something I feel extremely passionate about. That's where I had children. I'm really silly. I should have had them here, shouldn't I? Now, but what you need to look at is the next slide. Look at the cumulative effect of that when it comes to pension income, right? In the UK, there's something called auto-enrollment, and it means that um, uh, you have to, an employ, um, employer has to put you into an, an, a pension scheme, and they have to invest 8% of your salary. You have a tax benefit on going into pension in the UK, but you pay tax on taking your money out. Um, of that 8%, 5% is contributed by the employee and 3% by the employer. Now, if you start with a smaller investment amount and you factor in returns of an investment over a career, starting at 22 years old, retiring at 67, probably not when we're going to retire, but anyway, that's for some people, the effect of earning the average wage and men and women investing exactly the same amount means that women have 43% less in their pension pots. This is a massive problem, a massive problem, because of course the average woman can't maybe afford to invest more than 8%. But the gender inequality in employment income becomes staggering amounts in retirement income and many women live in poverty during retirement. Now, this is my final slide. Is that all right? So, what we need to do, or what I'm doing, is I'm educating, I've set up a series of investment lectures where I'm, I've, I've um, um, premiered them a few weeks ago at King's College. Um, where I'm educating women and other excluded customer groups, actually I had quite a lot of men attend the event, about investing and pensions and, and tax-efficient wrappers. I mean, pension is a tax-efficient wrapper, investing is what goes into it effectively. And then we need to investigate gender bias, well I will do this, investigate gender bias to the average advice person. Because the FCA in the UK, the Treasury, the UK Treasury, they want to develop an advice model that is available for everyone, also excluded group. But in order to do that, they haven't thought about gender bias at all. So I put this on the government agenda, I put it on the FCA agenda, is that we need to look at this. So my next piece of research needs to look at investment advice to the average client to see whether or not there is a bias there as well. Most likely they will be. And then we need to encourage women to become financial advisors. Okay? On that, I just wanted to say one thing, um, is that when it comes to, we talked a lot about the culture, we talked about different things in the panels earlier on as well. So if you have society as a whole, here is men, right? And then you have women, and then you have um, gender neutral people or um, bi non-binary. Um, within the men, you're gonna have more alpha males 
than you're going to have in the woman category. Remember what I said about nurturing and aggressive? But the fact is that you are, women are naturally probably a bit more nurturing than men, right? That's sort of how we measure in our, in our brains. But we can develop the other side. But not all of us are going to be alpha male, that type, right? But within alpha, in, in the alpha male group, you have more alpha males than you have alpha males in the female group. Banking, the way it's set up right now, is an alpha male kind of industry. Therefore, when people talk about we don't have the pool of candidates, it's because we are recruiting from the alpha male pool. We have to think about the wider pool and we have to mirror our client base. If our client base is growing in numbers of rich women, they are the ones that we have to cater for, right? And they are not going to want to do business with the alpha males because they're going to feel patronized. All right, I think I'll end there. Thank you very much.